Subscribe if you like scary stories. Approximately a year ago, on my 15th birthday, I received my first mobile phone as a gift from my parents. They finally decided to get me one, and I truly enjoyed using it, especially during late nights when I would spend hours just browsing. At my school, I was one of the last students to get a phone. Moreover, I didn't have a personal computer, so this was my initial opportunity to access the internet without any supervision. I became a member of several online forums and chat rooms, often lurking and observing the conversations. A few weeks later, I was in bed, using my phone late at night, when I received an unexpected call from an unknown number. This was peculiar because my friends never called me. We always communicated via different applications. The only people who ever called me were my parents, but they were already asleep. Driven by curiosity, I picked up the call. The person on the other end remained silent at first, only breathing heavily into the phone. Then, in a low and raspy voice, he said, I see you. My initial reaction was to hang up immediately and try to forget the entire incident, and that's exactly what I did. However, a few seconds later, I received a text message from the same number. It was a photo of my house taken from the street outside. My bedroom window was visible in the picture. Although the light was off, I was almost certain the photo was taken that very night. I observed that my curtains were half open, exactly as they appeared in the image. The thought of the stranger standing outside at that moment sent shivers down my spine. I sprang up from my bed, feeling as though a bucket of ice-cold water had been poured over me. Despite knowing that my parents would be upset about me staying awake so late on a school night, I knew I had to inform them. I dashed down the hallway and knocked on their bedroom door. Upon opening the door, I showed them my phone, with the picture of our house still displayed on the screen. As they exchanged worried glances, I could tell they were deeply concerned. Initially, my father suspected it might be a prank, but my mother was extremely distressed. I informed them about the phone call, and I was convinced it wasn't a joke by any of my friends. Frightened, I suggested calling the police, and my parents concurred. We dialed 911 and explained the entire situation to them. The operator assured us that a patrol car would be dispatched to investigate. As we anxiously waited, we peered through the window, trying to spot any indications of the individual who had snapped the photo. That's when we noticed him, a shadowy figure of a man, standing on the street just beyond the illumination of the streetlights. He was observing our house, just as he had claimed on the phone. My father quickly grabbed a flashlight and dashed outside, shouting at the figure. However, by the time he reached the spot, the man had disappeared without a trace or sound, as if he had evaporated into thin air. The police arrived a few minutes later, and we recounted everything we had experienced. They searched the vicinity, but they were unable to locate anyone fitting the description we provided. They recorded our details and assured us they would remain vigilant for any suspicious activity in the area. After the police departed, my parents sat down with me for a serious conversation. They cautioned me to be more mindful when using my phone and never to answer calls from unknown numbers. I confessed to having shared my phone number on some of the social media profiles I'd created. We deduced that this might be how the stranger had found me. The following weeks were filled with anxiety. Every time my phone rang, my heart skipped a beat, fearing it might be the same number. I was even terrified of glancing out my window at night, apprehensive that I might see the mysterious figure on the street once more. However, eventually, life returned to normal. The police never found any leads, and the person who had called me never contacted me again, at least as far as I know. On a weekend evening, I found myself at home alone since my parents were out of town, and I had just come back from a sleepover at my buddy's place that had been unexpectedly cancelled. Upon entering the house, I noticed that the lights were already on. Not long after, I received a phone call from the same friend, which would turn out to be the final ordinary occurrence of that night. My sibling was engaged in a video game in the adjacent room, and I could hear the rapid tapping of the game controller while I talked on the cordless phone. As I meandered through the living room, I eventually concluded the phone call in the kitchen. It was then that I heard an unusual, high-pitched squeaking noise emanating from somewhere within the house. 
The source of the noise was impossible to pinpoint, as it seemed to be the same volume in every room I checked. Roughly a minute after it began, the sound ceased, and the phone rang once more. However, the phone was no longer in the kitchen where I had left it. Instead, it was on the bathroom counter in front of the sink. I picked up the call, but there was no one on the other end, so I hung up. It was then that I began to hear a sound reminiscent of a large, heavy object being dragged in the attic above me. I tracked the noise as it gradually moved from one room to another, finally stopping in my parents' bedroom, where a waterbed was still in use. Once the noise reached the far wall, it stopped, and the phone rang again. This time it was my friend on the other end of the line. After I informed him of the bizarre happenings, he urged me to exercise caution and contact the authorities. Once I hung up, I lay down on the waterbed, only to hear a knock at the door shortly after. I quickly opened the door, but there was no one there. Frustrated by my brother's apparent disinterest in the strange events, I was caught off guard when he called me from his room to examine something he had discovered in the video game he was playing. Annoyed, I stormed into his room, only to find it empty. The bed was neatly made, and the room was impeccably clean. To my astonishment, neither the gaming console nor the television was switched on, and the controller was neatly coiled and disconnected. There was no way my brother could have hidden and tidied his room in the brief time it took me to reach it. I realized that I had been alone the entire evening, under the impression that my sibling was in the neighboring room. Then the phone rang once more. However, it was no longer where I had left it, and instead, I found it on the kitchen counter where I had initially placed it. So, I traversed the whole house to pick up the call. It was my friend calling again, mentioning that the call had been disconnected for some reason, and he was trying to reach me once more. I recounted the recent events to him, and as I did so, there was another knock at the door. Standing right beside the door, I glanced through the window, but no one was there. At this point, I opened the door and stepped onto the porch to make sure I didn't see anyone fleeing the scene. My yard was spacious and open, with no hiding spots. I ventured into the yard to investigate, but I found nothing. After several more minutes of conversation, my friend hung up, and it was then that I saw a pair of enormous, dark, reflective eyes staring back at me. The figure was tall and slender, positioned about ten feet away from the shadow cast by my garage. The creature displayed an unnaturally broad smile, revealing its oily, metallic teeth that stretched from ear to ear. Despite gazing directly at the being for over five minutes, I pretended not to notice it, and through sheer willpower, managed to enter my house without sprinting. I recall feeling that if I had run, it would have pursued me, and somehow, I knew it would have effortlessly caught up with me. For the remainder of the night, I barricaded myself in my room, unable to sleep until the sun rose the next morning and my parents returned home. I had never experienced anything like that before, and nothing similar has happened since. My name is Daniel, and I want to share a truly frightening experience that occurred to me. I reside alone in a leased apartment, and work from my living space the majority of the time. It was during one of these work-from-home days when the incident transpired. I was seated at my work table wrapping up some tasks when my phone started to buzz. The incoming call displayed a withheld number. I frequently receive unsolicited calls, usually scams, but occasionally I answer them just in case it's something crucial. I picked up this particular call, but no one responded from the other side. The silence was unsettling. All I could discern was the faint sound of someone breathing. Suddenly I heard an ear-splitting scream in the background. It's difficult to convey the nature of that scream, but I can say it was one of sheer horror. It would have been incredibly challenging to fabricate. I was utterly convinced it was genuine. I remained silent, sitting in shock. My hands trembled as the alarming noises from the other end of the line continued. Eventually, I mustered the courage to end the call. I stared at my phone for several moments, contemplating my next move. Feeling unsure, I decided to contact the police. As the operator answered, I recounted the incident. They inquired if I had any clue who could have placed the call, but I was at a loss. The number was withheld, and there had been no conversation from the other side. Days went by without any updates about the mysterious call or its origin. 
I remained on edge, apprehensive that each incoming call would bring that same terrifying experience. I did notice a few more calls from undisclosed numbers following the incident, but I couldn't bring myself to answer them. I would like to believe they were unrelated. However, there's no certainty about what was transpiring on the other side of that line on that fateful day. Perhaps it was an accidental call from a nefarious individual in the midst of a heinous act, and I had unwittingly listened in on something truly dreadful. Alternatively, it could have been an elaborate hoax. Even so, that would have required an award-winning performance to execute convincingly. The blood-curdling screams still haunt me, and I firmly believe they were genuine. Allow me to begin by stating my profound affection for the oil industry. In school, when they assigned careers to everyone, my preferences were film directing or long-haul trucking. Instead, they assigned me to cooking. It didn't take long before I found myself working in the oil fields, taking up the role of a second cook, making sandwiches and serving coffee, among other tasks. I am a committed worker who enjoys the long shifts that span from 12 to 17 hours, and I find solace in the isolation. For the majority of people, spending 21 days in Conklin might drive them mad. Conklin is known for its extreme weather conditions in Alberta, with an average temperature of minus 54 degrees Celsius and wind speeds of 30 kilometers per hour. I often played the role of a liaison for workers who struggled mentally in these harsh conditions. Growing up, the only safe haven I had was my own mind. I have severe bipolar disorder and have spent most of my life in solitude. Thus, Working in the oil fields felt like a homecoming for me. I thrived while others who managed to endure these conditions without losing their minds resorted to substance abuse or alcohol. I, on the other hand, eagerly awaited the next opportunity. This particular incident began on Mother's Day in 2017. I finished work at 8 a.m., showered, shaved, and went to see my grandmother in Saskatoon. While on the road, I received a call from a company that had heard about me through word of mouth. They wanted me to help manage their kitchen as 15 to 20 people had just quit, and they desperately needed assistance. To my surprise, they met and even exceeded my wage expectations, increasing my daily rate from $285 to $312. The job was in Conklin, which alongside Boyle, Saskatoon, and Penticton in British Columbia, ranked among my favorite locations in the country. Still not entirely convinced, the woman on the phone mentioned that I would be cooking for firefighters working to address a crisis in Fort McMurray. That was the moment I knew I wanted the job. I was eager to help Fort McMurray in any way possible. I happily agreed to join the team and continued with my day. The following day, I was driving around with my closest friend Stacy, sharing my excitement about returning to the oil patch. The woman from the company called me once again. Are you able to handle extreme personalities? She inquired. Yeah, I suppose, I replied. Great, because five more people just quit on us, she informed me, causing red flags to go off in my head. Yeah, sure, it should be fine, I assured her. The following day, my internal alarm bells escalated to full-blown sirens. She called me six times, and this is the essence of what she conveyed. You're capable of dealing with extreme personalities, right? Especially very difficult ones? We hope so, because our head chef is quite particular. She might leave you to manage everything for days, and you need to be all right with that. I swallowed hard. You don't have any bizarre ideas about vegetables, do you? She snapped. Vegetables? I inquired, puzzled. We don't serve vegetables here. It's pork chops, unseasoned meatballs, or burnt rice. If people want any of that hippie stuff, they can look elsewhere. No, that should still be fine, I reassured her, feeling increasingly anxious. I packed my bag with as much granola as I could, hoping to avoid eating any meals at the camp. Another suspicious detail caught my attention. The fires were in Fort McMurray, and the camp was supposedly in the remote Conklin Forest, four hours east. The woman claimed to be at the camp, but when I traced her cell signal, it placed her in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Her boss's cell signal indicated he was in Loch La Beach, Alberta, although he was supposed to be in Edmonton, where I was scheduled to meet him. This added to my uneasiness. Eventually, Friday arrived, and I was terribly sick. I maintain my body in excellent condition, watch my diet, and rarely get ill, except from stress. I was expelling fluids from every orifice, my thoughts were foggy, and I inexplicably had strep throat. Despite being a diligent worker, 
I finished dressing and packing. Finally, I experienced intense stomach cramps, as if someone was striking my organs with a red-hot metal rod every few seconds. I had to call it off. I texted my would-be boss, informing her that I was severely ill and couldn't make it to the camp. My body was protesting so vehemently that I had to pay heed. Two minutes later, I received a call from the head of the operation, the crew chief. Hi, is Darcy there? He asked, in the most exaggerated and thickest Alberta accent I'd ever heard. That's me, I replied. Well, screw you, he yelled into the phone. I adjusted the phone and cleared my ears after that outburst. He ranted for several minutes, attempting to make me feel guilty for not coming up. He even told me I belonged in a bog in Fort McMurray, and that he hoped I'd get run over by a semi-truck. He then threatened that if we ever met, he'd kill me with a shovel, and my body would never be found. All right, have a nice day, I responded calmly. He spat before hanging up. Standing at six foot seven and built like a South African rugby coach, I possess enough strength to headbutt an average person down a flight of stairs and through a glass door at the bottom. I am well trained in disarming individuals and can easily break bones. While his threat didn't concern me, it was unnerving nonetheless. For his own sake, I hope our paths never cross.